I'm going to talk about the yellow-legged Asian hornet today. You're all fully aware of it. I'm not going to do background into biology. I'm really going to talk about the response over the last year, what we've seen, how, what's going on in the background to that, a lot of which is unknown. Um, you're all familiar with the uh, Asian hornet. Uh, we now have loads of very beautiful photographs of it from our bee inspectors, um, and lots of them are uploaded on BeeBase if you wish to use them for anything. Um, I've, as I've said, I'm going to focus on this year, on the strategy we're currently doing. The Asian hornet nests up to 2022 to give you that background very quickly, but most of you have heard me talk before, and I've covered that previously. Uh, obviously, the nest this year, in summary, I'm not covering everyone, you'll be pleased to know. Uh, a little bit on the background awareness raising, which obviously, having 70 nests, has really brought that up. How to report Asian hornets briefly, how to spot and monitor for them. Then some information about what we do with nests and chemical treatments. A lot of that is trying to answer your questions that are passed to me to reduce the number of questions I get. So I'm quite self-interested in that, uh, which come through the BBKA. And then future decisions there. Now, Roger was right. There are certain things I can't answer. I cannot answer policy questions for the future. I can tell you what the current policy is. I can tell you the information we're feeding into that, but I cannot predict the future. That's other people's jobs, not mine. And I'll make that very clear as I go through. So background wise, uh, we're in an eradication program and part of the Healthy Bee Plan, as you're all aware, is to work together with stakeholders to prevent establishment. Uh, that is key, that covers all of us together. Um, but the main thing about this is that it's a government led and funded response currently. Uh, and all of these are government organisations within here. Uh, lead gathering is done by UKCEH, funded by DEFRA. Uh, track and trace by MBU, APHA, and we'll go a lot of detail into that. Uh, destruction by the wildlife team, and now some personnel from the MBU as well to cope with the numbers we've had this year. Um, and then the science by Ferris Science Limited, which I can start talking about the issues they've got of numbers due to the response this year. Uh, but really what I'm going to be saying is the DNA and analysis and the relatedness is all ongoing. Uh, and a lot of that will feed into those policy decisions that will be made probably in the new year to cut short a question that will come shortly, I'm sure. Um, so looking backwards, we've had uh, 13 nests in the 11 locations since 2016. You're all familiar with this. Uh, the 13 nests in 11 locations is because two of the locations had both a primary and a secondary nest. Um, and uh, roughly about on average two to three a year. So nice and calm and nice and steady up to this point. Um, also from about 13 other single sightings, which have been queens that have come in or workers that have come in in a container up to Scotland, a whole range of other routes into the country. And then we got to this year, 70 nests in 54 locations, uh, mainly down in Kent, but some up in Yorkshire as well and Hull, but limited numbers up there. Everything close to ports, interestingly enough, or route, major routes in. We can't be clear about the route they've come in, but the, that's all an indicator at this point in time. Obviously, south coast, and obviously, what's the risk on the south coast? We're close to France. So, so why the increase? We've got an established population in France. Averages are one nest per km squared, going up to 15 to 20 nests per km squared in built-up areas and villages in the countryside where they have their best habitats. Um, Increasing population density in northern France over the years, which is what part of why we've reached this problem of this sudden influx this year. Uh, I've put Jersey under France here, apologies for that, but that's just simplicity. Uh, over 300 nests so far this year, uh, a huge increase. They're showing the same increase. Everywhere in Europe is showing massive increases this year. Why? It, you know, uh, my terminology, a waspy hornet year, if you like, uh, a long warm summer last year, leading them to produce many, many queens, uh, and a good spring early summer this year, leading more queens to survive, have had an impact on that, certainly. And just to emphasise it, lots of routes into the UK. Uh, Dover's only 32km from France. 
Uh, they can fly that distance, they can land on boats, they can hitchhike, they can come a whole range of routes into the country. Uh, as scientists put it, human-mediated transport, okay, in or on vehicles, a whole range of things. I think we've had four sightings this year on ferries. To give you an idea whether which way they were going, they might not have been going the same way as the ferry was going necessarily, but um, just to give you an indication. Uh, public awareness, has there been any? Any of you heard of it? Yeah, there's been lots this year. I've limited, limited this to one slide. I could have put a whole talk on the amount of public awareness that's been done by the MBU, by the BBKA. I haven't put the BBKA bus up here, but that's because it wasn't anything to do with us. Uh, that was your, your, your uh, bus sign and very effective and very good, caused a spike in our sightings uh, that we'll talk about later on. Um, Quite a lot by ourselves or articles written by other people but involving us uh, and then some not quite as fact-based, shall I term it. Um, uh, wider awareness, well, this is the remit mainly of the Non-Native Species Secretariat, which is part of the MBU, and they have been doing tons in the background, uh, mainly to do with governmental organisations, but also things like the Royal Society Protection of Birds, Natural History, I won't read them all off, but this year down in Kent, they focused on the Royal Horticultural Society, the National Trust, parish can councils, they got Kent libraries to put up posters, so there was a lot of focus on public awareness in Kent because of the number of nests that we got down there. We also do a lot of work with pest controllers um, uh, and that's twofold, that's making them aware of Asian Hornet. Um, so we talk, I talked this year at the Chartered Institute, uh, I didn't talk from my room to the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health, uh, but this year we'll be at Pest Tech and we also go to Pest Extra uh, when they're run as well. Um, and and the, the other part of that is making them aware that they can't deal with it at the moment or shouldn't deal with it at the moment and that they're to report it to us. So that's twofold. And of course, looking to the future, if that changes, we'll carry on with that programme and tell them what the changes are. Uh, and then beekeeper awareness. Well, there's uh, lots of that going on. Uh, we have our RSS feed. Uh, and then this year, we changed really from using the .gov um, pages um, because they were quite slow to update, to doing a rolling news page on BeeBase, where every sighting was put on there when destructions happened, when removals happened, and tried to keep you as updated as we can with the limited number of people we've got doing comms. Uh, and then we have all the information in the background that you've already seen many, many times before. Our Asian Hornet posters with the ID guides on there, how to make monitoring traps, all of that. Uh, and most importantly, uh, we did have several calls from some associations, I would say, down in Kent as well, who didn't realise that we supplied free uh, lots of posters. Um, but you can have as many of these as you dare ask for, uh, any of those ones. Uh, and in fact, we've got postcards as well, uh, all of which are very informative, but please ask for them. If you don't ask, you don't get. Um, so we are willing to supply that in the hundreds to people. Um, no one from the office here to uh, have a go at me for that. Also, I recommend, I know not everybody likes the Asian Hornet in acrylic, uh, but it's the best we've got at the moment. Thorns provides these, not for a lot of money. I'd recommend that all associations get a handful of them to help with ID and training and the rest of it. Um, so preparedness, that's my job. My job as contingency planning is to make sure the agency is prepared within the limits of our resources uh, and we do loads every year. We do. Le I'm now moving into the lessons identified phase and I will disappear off your radar for the next six months when all of that is being processed, looking forward to the next year. Uh, and we work with all the, all the aspects of this, trying to make it more contingency building capacity is the term they use, but basically so we can deal with more nests. So UKCEH is forever uh, improving its system and we've got ideas of improving that, that we'll work on this winter as well. But that is scalable. Uh, well, I'm just going to say they're all scalable with the obvious examples here. Uh, MBU triaging. So the sightings that come from UKCEH are then triaged by ourselves because not all of them are clear. And we then decide, do we send them to an AHAT? Do we respond to them ourselves? Do we ignore them? And there's a whole range of process on that that would be another lecture in itself. Uh, and then there's stakeholder awareness. Um, Asian Hornet teams are key with this. 
They're absolutely essential to this response and I will repeat that and repeat that. People say you're not using beekeepers. We are using beekeepers. You are absolutely key to this. Um, and more and more of you becoming involved. I do look at the map quite periodically of this. There still are some gaps somewhere in the country. They're not in Kent, they're not in Hampshire, but further north. Can you encourage everyone to make sure their local associations increases the number of AHATs and people on the map for that? And then Track and Trace app. I'll talk today about the Track and Trace app. That's just a, a, a Arc GIS app in the background that helps us process all this data. But it does more than most people realize. It's not just a mapping app, but it does a lot more than that. And we also, um, in most years, um, uh, we send out eight to 10 inspectors to Jersey. Funnily enough, we canceled that this year. Um, all our inspectors ended up in Kent at one point or another, just about. So they've all done in-house training, if you like. Uh, we have 60 inspectors. I read many articles from beekeeper associations saying, you only have six inspectors in my area, but we've got 60 in total. We move them all down to deal with these responses at different times. We'll talk about that. Uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, I've mentioned lessons identified, so a lot of work going on there. We do gap analysis. We have, we're audited every year by one body or another. Um, and then we have the wider agency support. This has become really important this year. This is bringing in other inspectors and other parts of the agency to build up our numbers. They're all trained in different inspectors, plant inspectors, for example, and non-natives. So NNSS is non-natives. Uh, species Secretariat and PHSI is Plant Health and Seed Inspectorate. We brought in 20 of them this year to help. Uh, they use ArcGIS already, so they're ahead of some of our inspectors. They get straight in, they can use it, and they're working on the field. As we're taught, track and trace in the field is not a difficult skill to learn. People think it is, it's actually not. Those who have been to Jersey know that. You're usually doing it in the afternoon, you get there. <coughs> So I'm going to bang on. Asian Hornet teams, again, critical. And we really mean that. They absolutely are. Raising awareness is the, I think people think it's boring. You can't do enough of it. Go, go out and do talks. I do talks to Gardening Society and over any society that will have me. Everybody in this room should be doing that to raise awareness of Asian Hornet. All individuals, not just associations. Uh, helping public beekeepers with ID. Um, many of us have had, what, European hornets handed to us, photographs of goodness knows what. That is a crucial part of the role because it ensures that accurate reports are sent to us and we deal with the real Asian hornets, not with the wood wasps and all the rest of it. Um, and then wider monitoring. And that's both during and after a response. I have had many calls, some of which I will not be able to tell you the details of, uh, this year when people demand to know where a nest is. That's not actually the important factor. What you should be doing is looking out wider. Why? Because there might be another nest we don't know about. We're dealing with the one we know about. That's been destroyed, removed. That's why you've heard about it. Is there one five miles down the road? It could well be. And that's really the important bit for everyone to be doing that monitoring. You know how to report it. I won't go into details here, but the Asian Hornet Watch app is our preferred route by a long way. Um, have alerts gone up in number this year? Uh, just a tad. Um, OK, so a normal year, our worst year, I think about 10,000, uh, 18,000 so far and going up. I haven't counted how many were actually Asian hornets, but it's not 18,000, OK? It's still a very small percentage. Uh, and this all takes work. UK CEH go through every single one of them and read them, send a reply, decide what they do with it. That all takes effort. Um, how do you spot Asian hornet? It's, it's, it's actually easy. It's not difficult. And that's, you know, that always changes. The first time you see your Asian hornet, up to that point, it's impossible to spot because you haven't seen one. But as soon as you go to Jersey, you're unlucky enough to see one in the UK, uh, a response, you realize they're very easy to recognize. The yellow legs, I won't go into all of it. But where do you see them? Uh, on ivy, on any fallen fruit in the autumn. These are all UK sightings from previous outbreaks, all easily photographed. They're not defensive when they're feeding. You can get in and take a really lovely photograph of it. You might have to wait for it to return. The first time you see it will inevitably be when its little bottom is disappearing through the hedgerow. But they come back. If you've got a nest nearby, they come back. Uh, and then they're easy to take a photograph of. Um, other things to be aware of, I think, is this last point here. So this year we've definitely seen 
Uh, something we hadn't seen too much of before is when bee farmers or beekeepers have been doing some form of honey processing in a, in a, a greenhouse or a shed, that smell of honey attracts in the hornets. Okay, so just be aware of that as well. Um, Asian hornet spotting, well, the other thing they do is they feed on insects. They hawk, they chase after um, uh, all range of insects. You can spot them anywhere in the garden, to be honest. Um, uh, and I just like this photograph, that's why you're seeing it. Um, how do you monitor it for it? Well, it's very simple to monitor for it. We prefer to use Satira or Trapit, but you can use a wide range of baits. There are other baits becoming available as well, which are equally good. Try them out. You can use fish. You can use any meat. They love carrion. Uh, there is a problem with meat. After two or three days in your garden, it will attract other things and it does stink, but it is very good. The other benefit of processed meat like this is the hornets tend to give you a really good line of sight when they're flying from it because they just take a chunk of it and fly straight back to the nest to feed to their young. Um, and then there is what we, we use mainly a lot of, or a lot of, or we want people to use at the moment, though this is slightly changing towards the end of this talk, is wick bait stations. We don't want you to be using killing traps, and it's not because of killing the Asian hornet, it's because of the pup bycatch issue. Bycatch issue is a huge thing. I get loads of photographs, and I'm not showing them to you from beekeepers, even this year, with an Asian hornet on the top of a soup of other insects, inches deep underneath. Uh, and that is not something we, sh we should be encouraging or promoting in any way. Our track and trace app, this is going to be a little bit boring, but it's part of my job uh, and I spend my life with it, but it's, it's actually very key to our response. It has saved us a lot of head count. This has replaced us having to get extra people in, sending a lot of paperwork in. Uh, uh, so we have, uh, it's ArcGIS based. It's a track and trace tool for the inspectors. It's on their iPhones and their iPads in the field. They get data from each other real time. They don't have to enter anything on paper. They just enter it into the iPad and it instantly turns up on various different screens, including myself across the country. Um, they can use driving apps to find and locate the sighting. So when a sighting is put on, it's put on by the office. They can then just click on a button and their driving app on their phone takes them to it. And then they start off the track and trace from there. Um, it does real time mapping. I'll go into this in a lot of detail. Uh, and then the bits that are hidden behind it is it's a mapping and management tool. So I sit and look at a slightly different version and it's this version here. Uh, and I'm part of the National Disease Control Centre uh, and we use that to report how many nests we've got, how many bee inspectors we've got out there, where they're doing track and trace and we can show them all these different layers of it in copious detail, sometimes too much I would say. Uh, and then we use it for communications, so you see the simple maps that turn up just showing the nests that I've shown you, that comes from the same app, from the same data source, there's no repetition and that ends up on BeeBase rolling news page. And then the really hidden part of it, which is this year turned out to be absolutely crucial. Um, we've had over 3,500 individual samples sent in. Okay, Each one of them is barcoded and each one of them is immediately in the field, entered in, and no one's having to record it. They just shove it in the post to the lab and it turns up there. They look at it and go, it's a bit more complicated how I'm shortening it here, but they do the DNA analysis and go, that compares to this nest. And oh yes, it came from that nest, that's good. Um, and we'll go a more, little more into that. But this is very important. So that informs us of the likelihood of other nests in the area during an outbreak. In other words, are all the hornets around a nest from that nest? And if they're not, we don't leave that area. And there are people still down in Kent because of that analysis, okay? And that's why a lot of the science is taking a long time because they're focusing on those areas, which I hope you would want us to. Um, track and trace. This makes it look very complicated. Uh, the biggest question I get on this, this slide is how long does it take? On average, two to three days. Okay, it's not long from when we get there to when we find the nest. It can be very quick. It's weather dependent. Middle of summer. End of summer is very good. Middle of summer can be difficult if it's too hot because you only get limited flying periods at the start or end of day. Um, but when they arrive on site, this is a sighting here, so the green dot is a confirmed sighting. Uh, the first thing inspectors will try and do is get a sample if there isn't already one there, um, and then confirm that it's Asian Hornet. Uh, if there's no sample, then they'll put out traps in the area to trap. Um, and if they start seeing hornets coming to them, they change these debate stations, because what we want to get very quickly 
is that line of sight. So usually within the first day to the second morning, uh, we're onto lines of sight. Um, now the inspectors this year have started to be tidy with their recording and, uh, they've been, and that's mainly because they're dealing with such a lot, they're trying to make it clear for themselves. And at the end of each of these, or the start of each arrow, would be a bait station. But those have been removed. But the important bit from my point of view is this line of sight. So we very quickly, in day two, got these lines of sight coming down this direction. Now hornets do not always fly in a straight line. So when you see them go off from the bait, they may fly to the end of the street and then take a left. But they all help inform you of that and it just builds up a picture. And then you start moving towards it with bait stations, as many of you have seen and done in Jersey. And then the next day they find the nest. And that picture is true for the majority of cases. Uh, it doesn't stop there. So we then move to the uh, post-destruction stage uh, and we basically want to mop up all the hornets in that site. And I'll talk about the destruction in a bit more detail in a moment. But often when we do the destruction, a lot of hornets start flying. Nests at the top of the tree, you've got cherry pickers coming in, you've got people wandering around, the hornets vacate, they can tell something's going on, they move away. And then we mop them up by trapping as long as it takes around that site. There's another reason for doing it, and that's just in case there's a primary or a secondary nest just next door. So we keep going until we have five clear days, that's clear hornet flying days, where we haven't seen hornets. Okay, now normally that can be quite a while and by that time the genetics has catched, caught up with us and that will be telling us that all those hornets came from that nest and you can move on to another site. If it doesn't, we stay there and try and find what the other nest is. Does that make sense? How do we mark hornets? Carefully, okay. Um, they, don't, they don't stink really when they're at this feed state. That doesn't mean they haven't, <laughs> but on an average they don't, okay. They're feeding, they're focused on feeding. You can mark them just by dabbing on the back, you can put them in a queen cage, you can do all sorts of things. Uh, we use one, when you're trying to stick glue on the back, uh, and this varies between bee inspectors, and please go and talk to them on the stand and they'll tell you, oh, Nigel was talking a load of rubbish, we do it like this. They all do it differently, but talk to them about it. Um, another way is to stick on a bit of tin foil um, or cotton or anything, but this is tin foil that's been used here because it, it, it reflects the light as they're flying and gives you that extra distance that you can see the line of sight as they go off. Um, and then there's a the traditional just banging a bit of paint on the back uh, as normal. Uh, all this is done under licence from Natural England, okay, um, which covers all the bee inspectors and anyone who works with us. Um, uh, and that's part of my job is getting that licence and maintaining that. And we've just renewed our licence for another three years uh, last month. The management part of this, this is only a flavour of it. This is what I look at. Uh, and we see all the, this is a build up of what you just saw on the last four slides. Those circles are indications around the end, we call them lollipops, just to give us an indication where the nest was. And the nest was pretty much in the middle of this three. This hornet was obviously playing hooky and wandering around a bit. Um, but they get there very quick like that and that's the majority of cases. Uh, but what we can do on this, I can build up layers, we can answer all sorts of technical questions on it, uh, but we can also produce these maps that end up on B base and the rest of it. And there's a whole range of layers. This is uh, infinitely variable. Uh, might drive my bee inspectors a bit mad every time we add on another layer. And Christina and myself, I think, or Christina's just added on another, another two layers this morning. Uh, so that will be a, a joy to explain. The bit in the background is the sample data hub. So as I said, when, when we're mopping up all those hornets, they're collecting every single one, putting a barcode on them and sending them to the lab. And that is then turning up there so the DNA analysis can go look back and check that. So chemical treatments. Uh, we've had them in every tree of every type, of every height uh, you can think of out there. Um, uh, we use 0.5% permethrin uh, in general, uh, it's very quick acting, uh, it's applied with different length air lancers, all depending on how, how close you can get to it. Uh, the shorter air lancers are better and more efficient by definition, and also you're trying to hit a small target at the top of a tree with a wobbly pole, okay, and talk to the inspectors about the fun they've had uh, with that. We're now up to 14 APHA staffed. They are geographically spread across the country, so they're not all in Kent. That's to give us resilience, so when it turns up in Yorkshire or anywhere else, we've got staff 
uh, in those places as well. Uh, and we try to remove the nest towards the end of the day, but often there's a logistics issue with that when we're dealing with six nests a day and two people on the ground uh, at the peak times. Uh, and then we remove the nest if we can the next day or soon after, depending on its locality. And then the nest goes up to the lab for the rest of the analysis. Uh, so where do we find nests? As I said, just about everywhere. Uh, brambles seem to be a favourite for primary nests. Uh, we've had a couple in, um, in roofs. Uh, we've had a, one in the ground as well, in a hole in the ground. All of this ties in with the information you've seen from Jersey on their Facebook pages. I don't think that the rough percentages are any different. Um, but the major ones, uh, we've had bird boxes. Uh, this is one of my favourites on the underneath of a barbecue. Uh, the day before it was pulled out for a family party. They got interested in getting it removed, funnily enough. Uh, but that's a typical primary nest, quite small, hole at the bottom. Secondary nests get larger, entrance on the equator, if you like, rather than at the bottom in general. We have lots of photographs taken from the inspectors when they find the nests and put on the app. Most of them, if you're sitting at home and don't have a clue, they just look like the top of a tree. Yeah, unless someone tells you where the nest is, you struggle. This is one of the better ones. Uh, uh, and seeing nests from the ground is a real art form. And you can stand there and look for days, and then someone just stands a metre to your right, and it's dead visible. Uh, you need to know the spot to be in. OK, this is the nest so far this year, not all of them. Uh, a lot of primary nests in there. Uh, we will bring out all the numbers and statistics of this, numbers of combs, numbers of workers found in them, all of that in due course. Uh, so we've had 70 in 54 locations. Some locations have had up to, depending on the size of a location, seven nests. Um, we've had primary and secondary in the same place uh, in approximately 12. Now, there's a difficulty with that. That's going visually by what we think the nest is. Of course, a primary and a secondary, even if they're close together, might not be the same queen. They could be two separate queens, but the DNA analysis will tease that out in due course. And one of the first things we've had really this year compared to previous years, we've found full-size nests, okay? So the fisherman tail things, okay? Nearly, uh, nearly uh, 70, 80 centimetres long, 50, 60 across. Uh, what they find in Jersey and uh, France all the time. Uh, that's concerning, uh, and some of these nests are still being analysed at the moment. We've confirmed the presence of sexual stages in nests. We've confirmed males in the past, but never gynes. Uh, we have confirmed gynes this year. Please bear in mind, we're talking very small numbers at the moment, but they're still analysing the nest, they're still analysing the sample, so that could go up. Hence why I can't give you numbers. I can't give you numbers because we don't have them yet. Um, that nest analysis is ongoing. We will release details of where they are. That work is going on in the background, so anywhere where we think more surveillance needs to go on, that will be told to you as soon as we can. More surveillance is ongoing in those sites from MBU personnel at the moment. Um, the DNA comparisons is microsatellite. If anyone's interested in the process, I can send you some very exciting papers on it. Um, uh, and that is ongoing. Uh, we're confer conferring individuals to nests at the moment. That's 3,500 samples being compared one to each other. That's a huge amount of DNA work. I don't think anywhere else has done anything like it with Asian Hornet. Um, so that is fantastic. I know, I know that will sound weird, but that is really good. Uh, th that informs our response currently. The next stage is the really, really important one, is when we start comparing nests to nests. Do they come from a shared parent? Does that give us an indication of is there a UK population? We can answer none of those questions currently but we will get more information from that. And that will be analysed by policy over winter, uh, and they will uh, hold discussions with you or do announcements however they choose, that's Defra's decision, uh, in the new year. I'm not allowed to say anything more specific than in the new year, OK? Uh, but we are pushing for that. I've been in meetings. We are pushing very hard with Defra to get that in January. They have to think about it. They have to go to ministers. A change in policy from eradication will involve government decisions, okay, right at the highest level. So they have to plan that all out in advance. So it's not a quick process. Bit more positive, there are lots of new traps out there. I have not covered them all here, but the more selective traps that are available, um, the better from my point of view. 
Uh, we have tried guard apis, um, and it definitely catches Asian hornets. I think it's been used in other beekeepers have used it down the southeast as well, and they, they've had Asian hornet in it. Um, we've also used the Andamat one. Please go to the stand. There's several other different versions as well. Um, and that caught Asian hornets down in Kent very effectively. That was used as one of the mopping up sites. Um, uh, uh, and that's Andamat bait as well in there. They do their own bait and that works very effectively. We've only done quick and loose trials. Uh, in France, muzzles have been tried and I think thorns has the stop it and another couple of versions which you can think about. Th these help your bees to survive through the winter by reducing the amount of predation on them in the autumn, if that makes sense. So it pushes the hornets away and means they can't get as many bees, which means the bees can fly in and out a little bit better and they survive through. Um, and it does no harm, generally. Very importantly, uh, there's also the Hornet AI, which is here, that you can see. Uh, and these are camera traps using AI in various different films, which means we can eventually start to replace, when these become cost-effective enough for you to be using them, um, uh, start to replace uh, killing traps with traps that are completely selective and just recognize Asian Hornet and do it that way. Uh, we will be trialing out both versions uh, next year uh, on site, uh, but some of them have already been used in the field in Jersey, or both of them have already been used in the field in Jersey, and by all means talk to people on the stand. And thank you, everyone. And when I say thank you, everyone, I don't mean just to you for listening. I mean to all the bee inspectors, to all the various bits of the agency, all the AHAT teams, absolutely everyone who sent in a report whether or not it be Asian or it or not. Uh, this is really about a joint effort from us all. Uh, and we thank you all for your efforts. Thank you. I'm from Epsom. We've got a number of monitoring stations out. How long should we keep monitoring for? We are definitely seeing hornets flying now. Um, so first question to that be, which part of the country are you? Epsom. Yeah, so carry on monitoring, <laughs> carry on monitoring. Basically, I would carry on for the next month or so. It's weather dependent, okay? You know, in Jersey, they are still seeing hornets flying every day. We're not seeing them every day, but they are still flying. And a second question. And also, uh, there's another important point here. Are you going to get much bycatch from now on? No. Queen so wasps. Actually, a few queen wasps. Your beekeepers. I won't go into details there. Okay, move on. Um, so I've I'm on been, camera. <laughs> I've, I've been called out to a possible sighting, and there's an, is a what might be a wasp's nest, but a foot by nine inches across. Yeah. Yep. How, how can we tell the difference between a wasp nest and a hornet nest? Okay, I, I have to be a bit careful with how I say this. So the first part of this is very simple. If they're flying, you just do it on the insect that's flying. They're not flying. From there. No, 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 bear with me. <laughs> um, that's the really easy bit. And, and we do a lot of that ID is done just by the insects flying on them or landing on them. Uh, the hornet nest, and we have an ID sheet on bee base that you can see this from the French Natural History Museum that shows it. They're quite distinctive in their colouring. And if you're not sure about it, you take a photograph and you send it to us and we will give you as much advice as we can. Now. The most commonly mistaken nest for Asian hornet would be? Medium wasp, yeah. And another one? European hornet. Okay, we get lots of European hornets. The difference between a European hornet nest and an Asian hornet nest, European hornet nests tend to be in cavities. They tend to have open entrances at the end, uh, at the bottom, rather than a hole. Okay, it's like a whole bottom has been cut off and we see lots of photographs of these. Medium wasp is a gray nest. The hole is at the bottom, but it's slightly upturned. You have to be a bit careful because it's Dolce Vespula. I get it slightly wrong every time, but there's a range of wasp nests that are very similar to that. But the entrance hole is turned up and it's a gray color. The difficulty you have with that, that can be 10, 15 meters up in the top of a, a, a tree and we all struggle with those ones. But we're doing a new guide which is going to have a lot of photos from this year in and that will be available over Christmas as well. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. To what do you attribute the huge increase in the number of Asian hornets this year? Is that because they've suddenly decided they prefer England to France? <laughs> is it revenge for Brexit? <laughs> or, or more likely, is it that last year you didn't find sufficient yeah. numbers? And if it's the latter, do you feel you've ramped up sufficiently this year? I mean, every year there are going to be a, there's going to be a percentage that you haven't found. So have you ramped up sufficiently this year to make sure that next year goes down instead of up again? 
Right, there's quite a long list of questions in there. Let me try and it's, break it down. It's, it's one question, basically. <laughs> But the, to the first part, I don't associate it with Brexit or anything else uh, political at all. Uh, the, the French pro is a problem in the sense of it is established there. So we are going to get them coming across every year. That background two or three that we've had will happen you know, all the way up to Scotland, into Ireland, into anywhere. That's going to continue regardless of if we have an established population in Kent, uh, which will be spreading outwards if that's the case. The science... We hope, I think that's the best and strongest way we can word it, should be able to tell us when they do that nest-to-nest -nest comparison whether or not they are siblings from the same mother, whether or not all the nests in an area, so it's done on geography and on siblings, are, so they, the scientists tell me, I'm no scientist, so the scientists tell me that they can statistically give us a probability of whether or not it's come from France as single ones or with different genetics or it's an established population here. And that will be publicised in January, February when that goes public, when we have that information. They haven't got to that stage of the analysis yet or they've just started it this week, if I'm honest. Does that sort of help? Uh, I guess, but, you know... <laughs> we can't look backwards. Sure, you know? Surely the increase must be a result of not finding them last year. You wouldn't get such mm. a big increase otherwise. Well, Jersey has, France has, all the other countries around it have ramped up far bigger if you look at percentage okay. increase numbers than ourselves. Thank you. I think there is a difference of, of us not finding everything. So we have uh, track and trace everything that has been reported to us. So everything that has come to us, we have investigated it and we have found whatever it was there. And the genetic analysis support that. It's different if it hasn't been reported to us. If it hasn't been reported to us, we cannot do anything about it. So it's a big difference of not finding things and missing things or for something that it was there and we don't know about. So it's really important for people to look actively for hornets out there and tell us, I've seen a hornet. It's not just track and tracing. It's not, it's not all about track and tracing. It's people actively looking for them across the whole country. The more people are looking for them, the more reports we've got, the less chances of missing them. But everything that has been reported to us, and it was a credible sighting, we've been there until the end, and we've done all we, we could. So just wanted to come clarify that. Um, is there any data on where the Asian hornets are more likely to build their nests, i.e. in rural areas, in buildings, sheds, outbuildings, or in rural areas? areas. I have my apiary in the middle of a wood yeah. and um, I can't get there um, more than once a week and so I'm, my concern is if I put up traps near the apiary and I'm not there to be able to see if hornets are coming in whilst I'm not there, I might be drawing hornets towards my apiary. So is there any data that would suggest that they're more likely to be found in rural than uh, urban areas. No. Yes, there is. Sorry, I said no first. Yes, there is data to that, uh, and that's from the, the French analysis. We'll also provide our own uh, from this year's when we, we get to that point of looking at where the nests are and how close they are in various areas. In general, they definitely prefer urban areas, but when I say that, they prefer villages or small towns, and they prefer to be on the edge of that, where they have both buildings, they have lots of trees, they have lots of gardens providing food, they have water sources. In France, they definitely find they're very close to water sources, and that's often dripping taps, people's bowl of water for dogs because of the temperature there. That's not such, water's not such an issue in the UK, uh, as you all know, but they do prefer to be in those mixed environments, and they survive there very well. Will they go out into a woodland? Absolutely, yes. But if you've provided them with a food source, that maybe ups the <laughs> attractiveness to that area. I don't think trapping's really going to make a big difference there. I think you, they're either there or they're not there, and the trapping will help you with that going forward. I'd rather it be monitoring than long-term trapping, but that's the conversation we've had already. Um, they will nest anywhere, okay? That's the easiest way to say this. Cliff faces, okay? Brambles, all of this, they can nest just about anywhere. None of you, we're in a mixed environment in the UK. None of you, know, none of you live in the middle of a field with 10 miles of just flat field around you. 
I challenge anyone to put up their hand <laughs> at that point. No one does. That's the sort of viable they will not be in, but the rest of, rest of the UK, they will nest in. With previous ep uh, pandemics and epidemics, shall we say like foot and mouth and COVID, the problem has been that the government has acted too slowly. And by the time the problem has been solved scientifically, it, it is out of control. Um, you mentioned earlier on that uh, the, there's a lot of pest control uh, experts uh, yep. who get professionally paid. So my question, and you said they've been put on the sidelines at the moment. Hornets will, Asian hornets will not wait for uh, people to, to uh, for, you know, will not wait for human intervention. So by the time they're out of control, they'll just think what will happen is people say, oh, well, we ought to introduce these people now when it's too late, when okay. there's 10,000 nests per year. In, in a certain region. Yeah, let, let me answer that, and can I, can I beg to just differ with you in a, in a number of ways? They haven't been put on the sidelines. We are doing the eradication at the moment, so it's in our control for speed, using your own people, okay? That is part of the eradication process, if you like, at the moment, or eradication phase. Going forward, if you like, that could be, pest controls absolutely could be brought in. Is that actually a difficult ask? The chemicals they use are the current chemicals they're using. The methods that are used are the current methods that are used. There are trainers already out there that have trained us that are willing to kill germ and various other companies. CIEH and all the various pest controller bodies are aware of Asian Hornet, are aware of the protocols we use. So pest controllers can be gearing themselves up. But gearing themselves up isn't a big ask. It's what they do already. This is just a Hornet. It's in the wasp family. They already... I think we know pest controllers kill wasps, so there isn't actually a big ask there. If they want more work done with it, we're willing to discuss that and start getting inspectors doing training, but we have to balance with it all. Uh, but I don't think it's as huge a hurdle as people have, and they have not been excluded. I have talked every second year for the last seven years at pest controller conferences. Obviously not the ones you've been at, but <laughs> we've not missed, uh, been at the same one. But that is going on, that planning is for the future. I can't tell you when that will be, but we are planning for that. I just wondered if you had advice for beekeepers about next year. I hear a lot about uh, queen trapping. Are we best to put out bait stations early in the year? Or what's, yeah. what's your advice? We, we are going to give loads of advice on that because I get that question every day. We're, uh, that's part of the policy response will be that. Part of it involves what traps you use or we wish you to use. Do we, do, do we actually do the, some of that trapping ourselves in certain areas? Do we involve you? Do we both do both? So that will all come out in that comms in January, February time. Um, if I lived in Kent, would I be out buying some of the monitoring traps on various stands here at the moment? Yeah, I'd be the first one at that queue. Um, OK, I wouldn't necessarily be buying a video camera yet. I'd wait a while. But um, does that answer your question? Um, slightly related to the question before, my concern as a beekeeper who has been to Jersey now for th three, nearly three weeks um, is that you have a huge untapped resource of people who are just as much trained in track and trace as any of your yeah. NBU guys and possibly even more so, but you're not reaching out, you're not even finding how many of us there are. I mean, I would say to the audience, how many of us here have been over to Jersey and have already tracked and traced? Could you stand up just, just to give us an idea? And how oh, many of you are inspectors or ex-inspectors? Sit down now. Thank you. <laughs> but, th um, but that's my point. No, no, you, I get you, your point. You have a huge I, I, number of us. No, no, we're, we're well aware. Um, so first point is uh, just to correct that a little bit. We work closely with Jersey. We're well aware of the numbers of beekeepers that go out to Jersey. Um, most of you tend to ring me up and tell me that you've been there and what our response should be going forward um, after that. Um, we're not ignoring you. You are a resource, but I, we are not allowed to use you for track and trace currently, and that is a DEFRA decision. I, I okay? understand that. So the, you're up, please. So you need to take that to DEFRA or to government to convince DEFRA, not to me. Okay? Yep, and that goes for all right. the bee inspectors in here. Get that question Are every we likely day. to move at some point where the bee base, where we have to say whether we've got Ferrero or not or what have you, we would also say, we've been to Jersey, we have tracked and traced. 
because so, again, it's a resource. My challenge for that is we would happily put that information on there, but I would rather it not come in single emails from every single person. It should come from the BBK as a collated. Maybe that should be done on their um, AHAT page. You've been to Jersey and make that person a different colour, and then we could import that information happily. Make them pink. Do you have any data yet on how far the nation Hornet Queen can fly? Um, okay. Only because my experience of sailing my boat anything up to eight or nine miles off the Devon coast okay. is that a bumblebee can quite happily settle on it. And how they fly that distance, I don't know. Uh, remarkable. It is. So can um. Asian Hornet Queens, and therefore that would explain the rash of nests around Kent, is that a manageable distance for them to fly? So, yes, and they don't always need to, is the answer. So let me, let me expand on that. So if you tie a hornet into a wind tunnel, Asian Hornet Queen into a wind tunnel on a bit of thing and fly and blow the wind tunnel, they can fly the equivalent of 40 kilometers in one go. The French have done that, it's called hornet torture, okay? Um, so can it? Do they actually do that in reality? Who, who, who knows? If you look at the spread across France, they have spread on average 80 kilometers a year. That's going nest to nest. That does not mean the hornets <laughs> are flying 80 kilometers in one go. That's on average. Most of them only move probably that in that 30 kilometer spread area. But what you get is the odd one that overwinters in a pile of wood in the back of a container, and they go 200 kilometers. And hence why, if you look at the maps from the Natural History Museum, you see that spread at 80 kilometers a year across Europe. Okay? To answer your question, with boats particularly, they follow boats. They are renowned in France for following boats. We found them on ferries, goodness knows which direction going. They land on boats, they use them. If they're flying out there 30 kilometers, they land on whatever's in front of them. And that takes them another 200 kilometers. That's fine. We've had them on cruise ships going way up north. Goodness knows where they were thinking they were going. Did okay. they enjoy the cruise? Uh, no, they, they, they usually, by the time they get to me, they usually end up dead. So. Uh, you can still buy honey in France, despite the fact there's a hornet nest per square kilometre. Yeah. So what are the main measures taken by French beekeepers so that they continue to have their hives alive and they can produce honey? I think you've got a talk this afternoon by probably someone in the audience here from France uh, who, who will give you lots of information. There's a whole range on that. It's, it's a really difficult question in that we're not there. We're not getting that signs and that detail uh, necessarily from them. It's also very personal, okay? It depends if you are that beekeeper next to that town with 50, 20 hornet nests in it. Are they a problem for you? Are they reducing your honey yield? Um, over the last, we, we look at honey yields from France to use that as a measure of beekeeping, if you like. They've had record years over the last few years and then others report they've been decimated. Have they been decimated by Asian hornet? Have they been decimated by other stuff? You, that, that's always the colony not loss conundrum you get into. Is it a problem out there? I'm not denying that in the slightest. Absolutely. It, you know, it's another problem. But you do have to take it all with a bit of caution and investigate it in there. There's lots of methods they're using. They're using the JAD, JAD, I can't say it, JAD probe trap, which you've all seen. We're a bit nervous about that. You know, that's a big trap. It can trap many insects. They tend to use fermented honey in it. We, as bee inspectors, get nervous with anything with the word honey that's used as a, sort of a bait, if you like, but they do ferment it. Um, they use many chemicals out in France. They use shotguns to shoot them down. I've seen pictures of drones with flamethrowers attached. Should you be using any of those methods? Okay. So we have to be a bit cautious. And I get this question quite regularly, so I am used to it. Um, you're talking about bait stations in the spring. Surely it's queens that are flying in the spring? So why not just uh, trap and kill the, the Asian hornet queens? Uh, we were talking about tra tracking, trapping in the spring, yeah, what's spring the, trapping. What, what's the point of tracking a queen? No, not tracking, trapping. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> my, my Norfolk accent sometimes trips me up. Yeah, uh, OK, so just uh, you know, when the queen's are out. Spring be, trapping yeah. is for queens. Um, so in Guernsey, they've done a spring trapping, or as they call it, spring queening project. Uh, where, and please bear in mind here, 
they're a small island. Do not think we would be able to do the same in the UK to some degree. They've done one trap per half km square across the whole island. Okay? They've got relatively good numbers of, you know, they've got lot, you know, few, uh, many staff in a small island. Um, do they trap queens? Yes. Okay. Has that stopped nests the next year or reduced it even? Well, it's just the observation the being... The answer is no. So it's 90, what you've got to remember is 90 to 99.5% of the queens die in the winter. So even, or when, before they build a nest. So even the ones you trap may have been destined to, to die. So there's a real question with that spring trapping and how effective. Jersey had a record year for spring trapping this year. Also had a record number of nests this year. We have to let that science play. Will we be recommending spring trapping? And I think I've answered that question. Yes. To what degree, how far? Do I say every beekeeper should be doing it? You've just got to be careful and think about where you are. But Kent, yes. Um, with all your uh, bee inspectors um, going down to Kent to look for Asian Hornet, what happens to the rest of your service regarding oh. EFB and all well, that? I can, nicely, I can nicely sort of duck that a little bit. and I won't bring in Christina. I'll answer it for you, but she can come in if she wishes. So that's Christina's. Christina's job is the rest of what they do. I am continuously planning an Asian Hornet, particularly at the moment. Um, so, yeah, it hasn't stopped. So what you've got to remember, we haven't moved all 60 down there in one lump and sat them there for the whole time period. They've come and go. They've done really long hours down there. They tend to be down there for a week to 10 days. Then they go home, have a bit of a rest, and then in between, before their next cord on detached duty, we call it, before for their next cord for that, they're doing their normal inspections, answering the call outs. People are covering for them. Not every inspector can go down to Kent. Some have reasons why they have to stay at home and quite a high proportion do that. They're carrying on with the normal inspecting. They're doing other duties to support us and then they're coming down at other times as well. So it's not quite as clear cut. Have we had a reduction in inspections this year? Yes. Not, not going to deny that for one minute. And I'm sure Christina will have to write an article for BBK News next year uh, detailing that in some degree. Um, would you increase the numbers of inspectors? Oh, would I increase the number of bee inspectors? Yes. Um, that's not, my, not in my control, DEFRA policy. Um, I, I do know the answer they would say to that at the moment. There's lots of constraints on government, lots of other things calling on money from the government, all of which you're aware. So the basic answer at the moment is no, but that is a question for DEFRA and not for me. I appreciate you might not be able to go into detail, but this is a question we've had from uh, like people coming to our awareness days. Yeah. Um, and your slide about, it's about funding. So your slide that obviously said where government funding is going is quite helpful. But we have people that are concerned about where the funding is coming to the AHAC groups when we're encouraging people to put traps out and to, you know, they look at us and go, well, who's paying you? Who's, where do we get the money? Not everyone can afford the traps. And that's something we've been asked quite a lot. And I think we need to know what to tell people to reassure no, them. No, that's, that's a sensible question. And not the first time I've had it. May I ask what association you are? Uh, Isle of Wight. Uh, of course, needless to say. <laughs> Um, so I've had an email from Marla White recently on this topic, funnily enough. Um, so uh, the basic answer at the moment is you, BBK, associations have to fund that, okay? Um, government have answered that question. So DEFRA policy in a meeting, uh, Bee Health Advisory Forum is the great of the good of BBKA. Welsh beekeepers get together with government uh, periodically at meetings. Um, I was at that two days ago. That question was exactly asked, and the answer, no more money is available for that for the BBKA. Uh, and that was made clear. So I'm afraid that is the answer at the moment. Should you be complaining about that, please turn the camera off at that point. Yes, feel free. Um, does that help? Vaguely. I know it doesn't. Our association's being really supportive. Um, I know others from discussion aren't. So how do we encourage uh, beekeeping associations to engage? Um, and then... No, 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 that's a really important thing. And uh, I do it, um, lots of people do it. I'm sure all of you should do it. If it's your association, you're at this talk. You've obviously got an interest in this. You should be encouraging all associations. So for AHATS, which is one particular area that sort of spins off from that, I look at the maps and see where there are gaps, where there aren't AHATS, and we target those associations. And we say, why haven't you got AHATS? Do you want to be inspected to come and talk to you about Asian Hornet? It's a problem, et cetera, et cetera. So you should all be doing that. And to be fair, 
anyone who's looked at the AHAT map over the last five years, it's changed from being a sea of green plain to lots of dots. So it is getting a lot better, and especially down south, especially in Hampshire, especially in places that have had lots of nests uh, and Isle of Wight. <laughs> it um, is improving. And so a few of your answers have also been this needs to go to DEFRA. Is, yep. it, is it beneficial for us to start lobbying DEFRA and central oh, government? Oh, you are. MPs? I can tell you are. We need um, to keep pushing that, right? They, 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 yes, you do. Of course you do. This is an ongoing issue. That's your job. Your, your body of interested people, you should keep pushing. Uh, just one caveat to that. Try and do it in a big single letter so you get one answer rather than the thousands of individual same question answers. Um, uh, but that's something for the BBK to control and do. And I know there's been a process of doing that. I know AHATs have been encouraged to do that. A common letter has gone out because I get asked the questions from this. You don't think DEFRA policy answered this on their own? Okay, it comes back to us. So we, you, there is a little bit of we end up answering and spending our time doing that. So just be aware of that. But yes, you should still carry on lobbying. Nigel, there are a, a lot of areas of the country <laughs> which are really marginal for bees. Um, in the event of um, a, a mass invasion, do you think it will be almost impossible for pe people to keep bees in those areas? That's an interesting question because the question is if they're marginal for bees, are they marginal for Asian hornets as well? And I, I think there's a lot more to that question I'm, than I can I'm answer. I'm also thinking about uh, the predation as well. Yeah. But if they're not nesting there, they're not going to predate. Yeah. That, that, I, th I think that's a very difficult question. We'd have to look into that to some degree. Um, if the, the Asian hornet needs prey to survive, but it's not just honeybees. So if it's because there's no air, insects in an area, then they're unlikely to be there. If it's just, and I can't see why there would be an area where there's lots of other insects and not honeybees able to survive. So I'm struggling with that question a bit, but I'll try and deal with that another, yeah. another day. What top three actions can beekeepers take in the next two years? Sorry, you what to... top three actions can beekeepers take in the next two years? That's a really good question, but firing it to me like this. So get involved in your AHAP, absolutely number one um, uh, for that. Put out monitoring traps, preferably ones that get no bycatch. Be proactive and do lots and lots of awareness raising. Right, mid beekeepers, we're right in the middle of it. Um, are there any natural predators for Asian hornets? Okay, that's a really, really interesting question. Of course the answer is yes. Um, the, the simple answer is, are they here too? In any significant numbers? And before anyone mentions honey buzzards, I'm also a bird watcher, and honey buzzards aren't here in that big a number, and they don't do it. So the answer is no. There's no significant numbers of the right parasites or, or predators in the UK. Uh, parasites is really tricky. The whole point about a parasite is it doesn't normally destroy its host. So a lot of these various different things that have been investigated in France, that have come across from China in the nest, yes, they do slow down the nest, but they don't destroy them. Okay, and, and if they can, uh, so that instead of producing 300 queens, they might produce 150. That makes little difference really to the overall state of play you've got. Thank you. Does that answer the question? Just, just a very quick one, which builds on a couple of the questions about budgets and restraints and etc. You commented that, that Jersey's very small but has a lot of staff. No, it doesn't. It's run by volunteers. Alistair Christie runs a huge team of no, no. volunteers. And they are volunteers. I don't think I mentioned at all that Alistair Christie has a lot of staff at all. No, well, you I was were talking about, about the ratio on trapping. Guernsey of number of people to the small scale of Ireland for the spring trapping. That's you a did different thing to the number word of staff. staff. I'm they fully aren't. aware and have been over with Alistair all the way and before Alistair even started. Uh, and in fact, I knew Alistair back in the day when I did AFB screening on the islands when Jersey had a huge AFB problem. Uh, yeah, we, we know fully of the history there and I know all the staff and volunteers. Uh, yeah, I just think it's something that needs to be thought about more. It is absolutely being UK. thought about, but it's, it's, it's not going to my, be up to us. You're going to make me repeat myself, ultimately. not my call. Yep. We talked about monitoring. Yeah. Is it the same food that you need to monitor with throughout the season? So you have to say that again, same? Um, food that we need to monitor throughout the same season. Same bait. Yeah. Do, do you mean effectively? Um, 
Yes and no. It, it, it's a tricky one. So the hornet nests go for a really interesting life cycle for those interested in wasps uh, uh, generally. And, and during the peak of the summer, uh, we use Satira for all our trap and tra tracing. If we find that's not working, we switch to meat. Okay, and the, the inspectors on the ground make that call. And that all depends on the state of the play of that nest. Is it bringing home lots of meat? Is it using, needing lots of carbohydrate? And the hornets switch between that as they need it, depending on where the nest is in, in that life cycle. Uh, so for spring trapping, okay, which is one of the key areas we're talking about, then sweet bait, sotira, that sort of thing, absolutely perfect. Getting towards the end of the summer, if you're close to an outbreak, then you can do meat. But you do have to bear in mind the problems with meat in an area, attracting in vermin, vermin and the rest of it. And don't leave it for a week like we've done and go back and clean out your trap. It'll be smooth. Does, does that help you? So in general, Sutira. Yeah.